This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and today is Saturday. That means it's time for Nitsa Notes, my weekly vlog series where I talk about limited magic. Today we're doing a mailbag episode. I asked for questions on the community tab, questions you wanted me to answer related to limited, and I'll be answering several of them today. The first question comes from Mikey B. He asked, what are your thoughts on 17 lands? How helpful is it? How has it changed the draft experience? Do you think there are negatives to having this much data on limited? So if you don't know what 17 lands is, and you probably do if you've been watching my content because I talk about it, but you can go to 17lands.com, you can sign up to have it track your data from games, and then it ends up being this huge database that has, you know, the win rates for individual cards in specific situations, you know, whether you draw them during the course of the game, whether they're in your opening hand, what your win rate is when you don't draw them. So it ends up having, you know, in, in, by the end of most limited formats, like 100,000 drafts worth of data. Um, and so you end up with a lot of information about cards and how good or bad they are. So overall, I do think 17 lands is a good thing. I think it is helpful. Once there's a large enough sample size, which is usually like a couple weeks into a limited format, it's a pretty good place to go to sort of see how your evaluations are stacking up versus what's actually happening in the format. And it can also sort of give you a broad picture to help you understand what's working and not working in a format that you can't do all on your own. So, you know, basically you get more drafts worth of experience than you'd normally be able to. And I think that's good. The one area where I think there's, I guess, sort of a negative is that the data isn't, you know, the end all be all about how good or bad these cards are in limited. And that's because there are certain limitations placed on data. There are some cards that have a horrible win rate in basically every format that, yeah, if you just threw them in any deck, they're awful. And people overplay those cards. They play them in situations where they shouldn't. And that really weighs down, you know, the win rate of a card. But if you only looked at people who are utilizing the card when they've successfully built around it, you know, completely, the card is actually better than it looks. So basically what I would say is keep in mind that the data isn't the end all be all. It doesn't tell you the whole story, but it's an incredibly useful tool that can help you understand limited formats. And I guess another area that some people might see as a negative is it does become harder to discuss, you know, what's the best or worst cards in a format because you just have this data in front of you. There's not as much of a debate when there's evidence, but I don't personally see that as a bad thing. And you can still argue, you know, the data doesn't tell the whole story, like I said, and there are certain situations where you should be playing a card, but people are playing it too much. So there's still some leeway there, but there is, I guess, less debate to be had about cards, you know, once you're pretty deep into the format, but that's always sort of been true, right? It's just now we have specific data to point to instead of just, you know, um, experience from 100 drafts or whatever. The next question comes from Yoav Katz, and it's, would you like to see cards that aren't for limited being removed from draft boosters? Rare land, situational cards, uncastable spells, etc. This has been an interesting thing that I've heard people talking about in the world of limited, um, especially since they rebalanced, started rebalancing cards in old limited formats on Arena, like they did with Streets of New Capenna. And so there's this idea like, why don't you just, why don't they just take out cards that just aren't intended really, for limited, and replace them with actual playable cards. Um, and I can see the argument for that. Having every single card in a pack be somewhat playable would make things kind of easier for people to some extent because it's hard to make a completely horrendous pick. But to be honest, they've already moved really far in this direction, like over the last four or five years. I mean, we used to have a pretty good percentage, I mean, you know, like let's say 15% of the cards in a set are just unplayable. Um, and these days it's down to like 5% probably. Um, so they've already upped the power level of most stuff in Limited so that you don't end up with cards that are just useless. That's not to say they don't still exist. There are, you know, mythic rares and rares that are designed with commander in mind or with constructed in mind. You know, one of the more famous examples of this is like anytime they print a card that 
lets you uh, dig cards out of your opponent's library and exile them, like the Stone Brain, for example. This card has applications in lots of magic formats. It's already seeing play in them. It's pretty much useless and limited. Um, don't let anyone convince you that because you can name lands, that means it's good. It's not. It doesn't do anything, basically. And, you know, that kind of card not being in packs would be maybe a little bit better in terms of playables and stuff, but I think having some of these cards is good. I mean, I think, um, especially because, you know, when I evaluated that card and gave it an F in the set review, I have all these people in the comments telling me how good it is because you can name lands, which might mana screw your opponent, and there's lots of problems with that for a variety of reasons. You know, I'm not gonna go too deep on card evaluation in this particular video, but suffice it to say, most of the time you use the stone brain, it costs a card, it costs mana, and it basically has zero impact on the game. Um, and that's not what you want to do in Limited. But in Constructed, you can completely dismantle a combo deck and things like that. Um, and, you know, you can get rid of Tron lands because it can name lands. That actually matters. Non-basics actually matter. But basics don't. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, but I think it's good to include these cards, partly because some people do think they're good and they want to try them. Um, and I just don't think every card in the pack needs to be good, you know? <laughs> like, I think it's fine to have a few that aren't. Sure, it's a bummer to open it in your pack one pick one, but you can't have every pack one pick one be great either. There has to be some variance. Next question is from Ripujin. Uh, he asks, how, if at all, should you change your approach to drafting and deck building when playing in person as opposed to on Arena? Uh, so, I don't think a whole lot is... This, how I'll start things here. For the most part, I don't think that much changes. The one thing that is very different about in-person versus arena is you are actually drafting in a pod. Um, you, in other words, well, you're always drafting in a pod, but you're actually going to play against the people you're drafting against when you play in paper, and that is probably the biggest difference. Um, in a previous mailbag, I, I talked about some other things that it's easy to miss if you're used to arena like triggers and stuff. This is a little different um, because I'm talking specifically about the fact the very fact that you're playing against the same people you're drafting against. In Arena, you know, there's a small chance that happens, but most of the time you don't get paired against them, you just get paired against other people who drafted with other people. In paper, you always play against the people you draft against. And so this gives you a few advantages and it also changes things slightly. So the advantages you have is you often know, you often have some information about what's in your opponent deck, opponent's deck that you don't have otherwise. Because especially if you were passing to them and you have a pretty good feeling based on signals that they were in a certain deck, you're gonna like know they have certain cards uh, to some extent. You don't know for sure, you know, it is never guaranteed, but you have more information. And so that additional information can help you make decisions in games and you don't have that information on Arena. Second, you know, I've talked in the past about how hate drafting just isn't something worth doing 99% of the time. And on Arena, it's basically never worth doing. But in paper, it is worth doing like 1% of the time because you are going to play against these people. And so if you take away a bomb mythic rare that you can't play, but you know someone at the table is going to get, and if they cast it, you're going to lose, sometimes it's worth taking it. Um, it's still usually better to take a card that's good for your deck because there is still a chance you don't play against that person or they don't draw it or whatever. But hate drafting does matter a tiny bit, a very, very tiny bit in paper where it doesn't matter matter really at all in arena. So those are the two main things. You have more information. You know, the draft itself is a little different because you gain information from it and you can limit what your opponents get and actually have it matter some of the time. So those are the biggest things, I think. Next up from Plasma FT, have you played any of the Jumpstart formats? If so, what are your thoughts on the style of gameplay and how do you feel it stacks up against other limited formats? So I think Jumpstart's great. Um, I talked about this in this week's uh, top 10 where I had you know the new Jumpstart set as one of the best things to happen in Magic this year um, because I think it's great for teaching new players how to play the game without putting the pressure on them either to build a constructed deck or a sealed deck or making them draft, which is also pretty um, intense if you don't have, you know, if you've never done it before. The first time you draft is overwhelming. You, you know, you're just not ready to have to make these picks within a certain amount of time and stuff like that. It's very hard. So basically, you know, what Jumpstart is, if you don't know, is you get two booster packs. They're themed. You know, you don't know what the theme is till you open them, but you open them. And there's a theme where they're synergistic with each other. And then you shuffle two booster packs together, each of them with a different theme. 
usually, uh, and that makes your deck. And you know, it has lands, it has everything in it that you need. Shuffle those two packs together, and then you and your opponent can play a game. This is great in terms of how long it takes to get ready to play, and it's great in terms of, like I said, taking pressure off of a new player from having to construct a deck or draft a deck. And you just play with what you have. I mean, that's all there is to it. So you don't have to worry about that portion. So I do think of it, you know, you, you refer to it as a limited format here. And I do, it is a limited format, you know, in the sense that you just play what you have, right? But it's it doesn't feel like other limited formats in that there aren't any decisions to be made about what you're playing or about what you're picking. Um, so, but the decks you end up with often feel like fairly synergistic limited decks, because of the way they've designed these sort of curated packs. Um, so I think the game plays great. I think it's good for new players, um, you know, and it's fun to play a few times, but it's not, it doesn't have the same amount of um, input from you as, as other limited formats do. And overall, to me, that makes things like Draft and even Sealed better uh, than Jumpstart, even though I like Jumpstart, uh, you know, sometimes I like Draft and Sealed a lot more. All right, so our next question is from Alex Caps, and it's, what's your take on rare drafting? Is it bad sportsmanship, or do people overreact? For instance, all the ha hate that Pascal Maynard got for drafting the foil goyf, was it warranted, or do you think what he did was okay? So I think there's a few questions here, but first to address what a lot of people probably don't know, because it happened a while ago now, like seven years ago now, I guess almost eight years ago. Uh, in 2015 at Grand Prix Las Vegas, in the top eight draft, so very high stakes, um, the event was, it was whatever Modern Horizon set was out at the time, and Tarmogoyf uh, was in the set. And Tarmogoyf, is, well, at the time, all those years ago, was a highly sought-after card in Modern, one of the most heavily played cards in the format, and considered one of the best creatures in the format. Um, so it was worth a lot of money already, the Tarmogoyf was. This Tarmogoyf was foil, and it also had a special stamp from the event. They stamp cards, so it's harder for people to cheat when they, uh, like, you know, they have to play cards they open in the packs because they're specially stamped. Um, they can't, like, slide in a card from some other pack. And so this was, like, a, a very valuable uh, card at the time, worth over, you know, worth several hundred dollars, you know, four or five hundred dollars. Um, and it, this is, I think he was in his second pack and it was like pack two, pick one. And he had the option of taking like a good removal spell, like burst lightning, which was already what his deck was doing. He was in red or taking the Tarmogoyf, which is worth a bunch of money. Um, and so the question becomes, you know, well, the point is he took this Tarmogoyf. People lost their minds about it. Um, because Tarmogoyf, bad and limited. Great and modern at the time, horrible and limited, still is. It's hard to make it any significant size at all and limited. Um, and if it is, it's just a big vanilla creature. You don't have the upside of just playing a huge two-mana 5-6 uh, consistently enough for it to be what it is in um, Constructed. So people lost their minds because, you know, he's at this high-level event, the top eight of a major Grand Prix, where there's a lot of money on the line, and he did decided to take a card because of how much it was worth. Um, and so this particular thing, which went on to be called the Goyf Gate, uh, this was a huge controversy. Um, and in the end, I mean, what he did basically was a calculation of expected value, right? This Burst Lightning would have been pretty good for his deck. It's, you know, a premium removal spell. Um, that's great. But he also can make like 500 bucks without having to worry about the outcome of anything else for the remainder of the, the draft. And, you know, you hold on to that money. And so the calculation is how much money does Burst Lightning likely to win me? Probably less than $500. And this is why he made the pick. And it really angered people that anyone would do it. This is a very specific case of rare drafting. So that's why I sort of say this is two questions. That's That was a strange uh, situation that most of us aren't going to find ourselves in like ever, where you're in a high level event like that and you open up a card worth several hundred dollars. You know, like it's not going to happen. So in general, how do I feel about rare drafting? Well, um, I think, it, you know, if you want to do it, it's it's fine with me. Um, I don't think it's bad sportsmanship necessarily. You know, on Arena, 
uh, rares, if you get an, if you get four of rares or mythics, you start to get gems for when you get like the fifth, sixth, so forth copies of them. And so you have kind of a, it's a much smaller version of the equation that Pascal Maynard did. Uh, but you kind of have a version of it. Uh, you know, like, you know, I get gems up front here, regardless of what happens the rest of the way. Most of the time, I only find myself taking those rares when there's like six cards left in the pack and none of them are good for me anyway. Might as well take the rare because it'll give me gems. Like, um, but some people want to take rares, especially on Arena, to complete their collection or whatever. Um, and that's fine with me. And people sometimes people in paper want to take all the rares just to do it. And that's fine, too. I mean, you're not usually going to end up with that good of a deck if you're rare drafting. Um, that's just how it is. I mean, you, you can't just take every rare and mythic and jam them into a deck in Limited and have it work out for you. But... I don't I don't have a problem with it. I understand some people do. I understand some people probably disagree with me about the whole Pascal Maynard thing, but you know, whatever. <laughs> it's just it's rare drafting. People can do it if they want to do it. Um and most of the time it's going to be better for you in terms of your win rate if people are doing it. All right. So the last question I'm answering today is from Dakota and it's what block do you most hope to see, to see return as a draftable remastered set on Arena? So I think my answer to this uh, is probably Tarkir block. You know, I think I could name a lot of blocks that it would be cool if they put them on, as remastered sets on Arena, like Invasion block or original Ravnica, stuff like this. But that's almost definitely not going to happen, at least not in the next five to ten years, because uh, those cards are so old that there's not really a need to put them on Arena. Um, unless they eventually move, you know, Magic Online's formats to Arena, then maybe it happens. Um, so the one I name that I think is possible uh, is Tarkir Block. And the reason I think this is possible is it seems like for Explorer, which is, you know, the, the format, newer format on Arena that is a true to paper format, you know, only cards that are also exist in paper are legal in Explorer on Arena, and that format's been fairly popular. Uh, it's basically Pioneer, is basically what it's gearing towards, and Tarkir blocks in Pioneer, right? So I think anything that's within Pioneer, it's plausible that it could end up on Arena. And Tarkir block, especially Triple Cons, was a really great limited format. You know, it was a wedge set done right, where you really were, like, really in each of these wedges in all three colors pretty deeply. Um, the synergy was fun. Uh, it was just a cool set. I mean, and it's, for me, there's some sentimental value because while I had sort of been playing Magic um, here and there between about 2007 and, and 2014, I hadn't really had anything that really made me, really pulled me back into, the, into uh, drafting a ton, just like here and there. But, so that was really where, like on Magic Online, I started jamming a bunch of drafts of Cons of Tarkir, and it really got me uh, re-hooked on Limited, which I hadn't been in several years, and I'm still sort of on that, on that kick that started back then. So it's a format I really like, but also I think a good format. And I think it's also plausible, um, <laughs> a little plausible, that it ends up on Arena someday in some sort of remastered format. Um, it's still not that likely, because it's a set from like 2014, but uh, it's possible. So that does it for this mailbag episode. Next week, I'll be back with probably some other more general topic about Limited as we await the arrival of Phyrexia All Will Be One. Preview season starts for that pretty soon. Uh, it already has, I guess, but it really starts in earnest uh, pretty soon. So thanks for watching. If you want to see more of these videos, you should see the playlist on your screen shortly. If you want to make sure you catch the future ones, subscribe and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching.